This is the Mulligan Suit Podcast, the first one from the new Mill Bay Studios, and I'm proud to say it's with my friend Kevin Hearn, the Kev, acclaimed pianist, composer, multi-instrumentalist with Bare Naked Ladies. However, Kevin Hearn has released a new solo album. It's called There and Then, Solo Piano Improvisations, featuring artwork by Willow Downey, Gord's daughter. The album was produced by producer and engineer Mark Howard. As Kevin will tell you, I'm sure you'll know some of the people that Mark Howard has worked with. Bob Dylan, Emmy Lou Harris, The Hip, Neil Young. Uh, there's a video, by the way, for the song Lou, directed by Mike Downey. And how they made this music and how it was captured is quite remarkable. Just three hours on three days in three distinct spaces with three particular pianos. That was the form and the format to making this album. And so the title makes perfect sense for the solo album, There and Then, Solo Piano Improvisations. Very shortly, Kevin Hearn is going to head out on the road with the rest of the Bare Naked Ladies for a long-awaited, two-year delayed tour of Britain, starting with Royal Albert Hall in London. Hello. Canadian dates to follow. They're just happy to be playing again on a stage. They're a live band, as you well know. This is a very different podcast in that we are going to play at least four tracks, perhaps five. A conversation. We're just going to meander, friends. But do enjoy the music. This is, as Kevin says, he hopes it's a bomb on this day and age, in this day and age. B-A-L-M. Peace. Get blissed out, friends. Here we go. Kevin Hearn. I welcome to um, Mulligan Stew and the Mulligan Stew podcast, Kevin Hearn, a musician, artist, family person, friend. I found you where? Where have I found you? You're underneath the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> in my, my condo loft in Toronto, Ontario. Do you have a country place that you, you get out of town to? I do, up in Muskoka. Do you write there, record there? Do you, uh, what do you do? Uh, that's where I go to write. And I do, I built a little recording cabin up there. And I spent a lot of time up there during the pandemic, uh, just isolating and, and playing piano. Okay. Now, you know, we're going to be talking about there and then. There and then. Uh, piano, piano improvisations. <laughs> you could easily, easily have done it in Muskoka. You could have played piano until the cows came home. But no, no. You had to put an adventure to it. You had to, there yes. was quite an adventure. And we'll tell that story in just a moment. For those of you watching on uh, YouTube and video, those are packing crates in the back of my uh, studio here. We're mid-move, um, March 2. Let's start with uh, There and Then, because it's right in front of us. It's just been released, Piano Improvisations. In the grand scheme of things, what did you hope to accomplish with this of recording and release. As you well know, there's there's not many runaway bestsellers for piano improvisations. And so <laughs> you do it for personal reasons. What else? Uh, I felt um, I recorded it at the end of 2020. Yep. And I, I felt I would have liked to express something creatively after that kind of crazy year, which yep. we all went through in our own different way and had to navigate in our own personal way. Sure. But I found it difficult to write during that time. I found it difficult to express what I was feeling and when the in, in lyrics. Um, and so when the opportunity came up to do this, I thought, wow, well, this is a really cool way of just a direct plug-in into how I'm feeling at the end of this year. And being in isolation and not being able to hug my daughter because she, she lives in a home and, you know, just all the things, the band, you know, we'd finished a record, but we weren't able to play shows. And I thought, what an interesting experiment. Just go in, play a piano and, and let it out and see what happens. And at but the very worst... You know, I don't put anything out. But it didn't quite roll out like that. I mean, yet you could have gone into any studio and, and improvised. People would have left you alone. You could have done solo piano. But you decided to record in th three different locations, four different locations. At three different locations, yeah. O over three days. Yeah. Who chose the locations? Who chose the time? How did you meet? And who was uh, your partner? You needed someone to record all of this. 
Yes. Uh, okay. Can I tell you that I'll try to make it as short as possible, but it is an interesting story. In 2019, I produced and MD'd a, uh, a restaging of the Secret Path show, which was the brilliant record that Gore Downey made. And right. uh, we did it at Roy Thompson Hall and we had a after show um, get together. And this man approached me and we connected because he told me he was a cancer, a recent cancer survivor. Yep. And his name was Mark. And so we talked about that for about 40 minutes and eventually got to, well, what do you do, Mark? And he goes, oh, I produce records. <laughs> I said, oh, <laughs> have you produced, you know, any artist I might know? He said, well, I've done records with uh, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Tom Waits. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> okay. I think I've heard a couple of those people. And uh, it was Mark Howard. Um, and so... At that time, the Bare Naked Ladies were just getting ready to record some new songs, and and Mark came on board to record us, and we were living all together. Um, and I would come upstairs in the morning and just warm up on the piano, and Mark would say, "Well, what is that?" And I say, "I don't know. I'm just making it up." The next morning, okay, well, what is that? <laughs> I'm just I'm just warming up, Mark, just noodling about like I do, and. Um, he said, we should make a record like that. Ah, there you go. Yeah. And he'd, he'd made records with a, a pianist named Harold Budd and made records with Brian Eno and Roger Eno. So he knew that world of ambient music. And so it was, yeah. Ambient music. Explain to the audience and, and myself. I see ambient. the phrase. I say the phrase. I hear the phrase. But what does that, what are the parameters of ambient music? I think it's sort of an abstract uh, expression, usually instrumental music. Brian Eno said that um, Brian Eno is kind of considered the, the godfather of ambient music. And he says that ambient music should be interesting, but also completely ignorable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you, you can actively listen and enjoy it that way, or you can put it on and it can just become part of the atmosphere that you're in and um, you can enjoy it that way as well. All right. So let's give folks an, ex an example because it's just two guys talking and nobody's playing piano. Tell me about the power ballad of <laughs> Among the Stars. Among the Stars. Yeah, that's sort of a waltz that came out of an improv. And that's one of the songs that has the most structure on the record. Yeah. I was thinking, um, you know, I, I paid tribute to Gord Downey and, and sort of put the title Among the Stars because that was the indigenous name he was given shortly before he passed away, A Man Who Walks Among the Stars. So it's a tribute to him. All right, here it is, Among the Stars, Kevin Hearn, There and Then.
He's Kevin Hearn. I'm Terry David Mulligan. We're uh, examining his uh, latest uh, release, There and Then, Piano Improvisations. Uh, came out February the 11th, uh, charging up the uh, Spotify charts uh, with plays. Because it's just going to get played. Listen, here's the thing. People aren't going to play just one track. They're going to let this music and this album have the room. Because one leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. You might be totally blissed out by the time you're done. Or perhaps uh, you've thrashed about in bed, whatever. You, uh, it's, it has, <laughs> <laughs> there's no parameters to it. It's fantastic. Oh. Um, what you thought it was going to be like as an experiment and what it was actually like, were they slightly different? Um. No, you know, the only difference is what I what I hoped to do initially when Mark called me and said, let's actually do this. I, I had the idea that it would be fun to find haunted spaces that ah. have hotels in them, okay. you know, which I've run across places like that in my travels. And I, I always found it inspiring to play in a room that has a vibe or an energy or spirits in it, you know, Um I went to this ghost town in Arizona once called Jerome. Yeah. And oh, I know. I don't know what's up on the hill. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. That's where. Have you? That's where. What's his face from? Um, from one of the tool. Tool. That's yeah. where he has his winery. Yeah. Yeah. And they they've turned the old hospital into a hotel. Yeah. And so yeah. I said, "Do you have a room?" And it, the room was the whole top floor because. There's no one there. <laughs> Did you know what that town reminded me of? The set at, well, uh, in the Popeye film. Like they have the pipes hanging down. They think, well, like an Altman set or something. It was, I just love that place. And, yeah. and he was our, our, our host. We were there to drink his wines. That's cool. Did you like his wine? I loved his wines. Yeah. <laughs> drink cr- insanely good wines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When I was there, I learned that he lived there and owned the winery. And I thought, that's pretty cool. That's, you know, yeah. Um, and so in my room, there was an old piano yeah. and I just, that was the first time I was like, wow, the room really makes a difference and the piano makes a difference. And so I suggested to Mark, let's find places like that, that have um, some energy and an old piano yeah. and we'll go and record. Cause Mark's thing is he doesn't go into recording studios. He always likes to set up in a place. You know, like he did Willie, um, Willie Nelson's record Teatro was recorded oh, with, in an with, old with, um, movie theater. Yeah. Yeah. I so, love that album. Love that album. It's a great album. So um, we couldn't travel around as much as we would have liked to. So he sourced out three places in Quebec that we could drive to and drive back. Okay. No restaurants were open at the time. It was very much like go in, do this and get out kind of thing. That, that winery in Jerome, that's Apache territory. There's spirits there. Oh. There's no two ways about it. There's a lot of spirit there. You can uh, feel it. Um, when did you know, uh, uh, I mean, you can't go back and re or did you go back and re-record, or is it one time, this is it, this is our day, we're going to record, walk away kind of thing? Yeah, that's why it's called There and Then, because yeah. what you're hearing is what happened. There's no overdubs, there's no edits, there are pieces that we didn't include because they, you know, either weren't that interesting or they went off of a cliff, so to speak. <laughs> so <laughs> we sort of harvested the best that what we felt was the best. Uh, go, play, leave, basically. Yes. Okay. And and no talking, really. Like I told Mark, I don't want to talk about bands or sports or anything. I, I just tell me where it is. I'm going to walk there. I'm going to go inside, sit down and play for three hours and then leave.
Why are you? Why are you causing such a problem? Why are you doing it? I'm a <laughs> diva. <laughs> God, um, Kevin Hearn is the name of that diva. Um, now, you know, if you were still making music with Corky and the Juice Pigs, this would be a skit. <laughs> There'd be something in there. There would yeah. be something in there. Um, yeah. So, did you do? You, do you were you a fan of Corky and oh, the Juice God, Pigs? Oh, well, totally, totally. From day one, I loved okay. them. I loved that humor, that absurdist humor. I loved how much they set up themselves and everyone in the audience. It was wonderful. Anyway, I wanted to ask you about Lou, of course, uh, because I, I thought it was about Lou Reed, who you led a band for and with for many years, uh, 2007 to 2013. Um, but, but the... I, well, first of all, there's no lyrics, except for the ooze. Yeah. Did the ooze become blue? Uh, yeah, I decided when I was trying to make titles for the record, oh, it sounds kind of like Lou. Well, let's put, play, pay tribute to Lou, and this one's for him. <clears throat> so do you, when, when you play, uh, do you still see Lou? Can you hear Lou? Can you feel him? He's always around. I miss him so much, Terry David, and... Uh, I always think, what would Lou think of this, or what would he say? You know, the uh, tell me the the Lou Reed that we knew publicly, and the and the Lou that you knew privately, vastly different. Um, I wouldn't say so. I think you know people seem to dwell on this um, this image of Lou as very cantankerous Anger. and nasty, Anger. and he could yeah. he could be that way, but he was also a very loyal and loving friend and husband and he was one of the nicest caring guys i ever met and probably the funniest guy i ever met oh man just saying a lot being the cousin of harland williams <laughs> yes, yes. uh 13 movements 53 minutes other than among the stars was there another moment that spoke to gord and secret path and and his life uh, well, I did ask his daughter, Willow, to do the artwork. Yes. And um, she listened to the record while painting it. <clears throat> and that's it there. But And where is the original art now? Um, that's uh, highly classified information. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I have it. Um, I'm getting it framed. Yeah. Okay. And Mike Downey... Uh, Gord's brother directed the, the video, video for yeah, I love the video yeah, for Lou. Yeah, the years ago I played on Gord's first solo record called um, Coke Machine Glow and uh, a song called Chancellor, which has always been one of my favorite things I've ever done. And Mike directed the video for Chancellor, and I always loved it. It's in black and white and kind of haunting. And um, so I, I thought that'd be a cool thing to try and do something, collaborate with Mike for Lou.
normally when, when we do interviews like this, as you well know, Kevin, we, we have a lyric sheet in front of us. And you say, why did you, are you actually, what are you trying to say with this song? I guess these tunes are going to be what we think they are, what they, what re- reflection we have within ourselves, which is very exactly. personal. The titles don't matter. They're just a point of reference. It's just an abstract expression and yeah. hopefully yeah it brings different images or feelings to everybody well, i hope it takes people to a, a relaxed peaceful dreamlike place and that they could just drift off to it if they want no boogie no woogie no <laughs> radiating the 88s nothing like that none of Let's that be, what are you becoming a beat poet now <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> however there is one very specific title that I got to ask you about. Okay. Garth Institute. The Garth Institute. Yeah. yeah. Um, Garth Hudson from the band, you know, he's a friend of mine and uh, a hero. And I'd been doing some work with him over the years. And him and his, he and his wife, Maude, were talking about this school they wanted to open, mm. uh, a music school called the Garth Institute. Okay. Okay. And Garth would just wander around from classroom to classroom and give sort of impromptu seminars about different topics of music. Of course, the school never um, <laughs> happened, but I thought the idea of the Garth Institute was kind of a nice daydream. And so I think it could live on in this, capacity, in this way. Three hours and three days, three spaces, three pianos. How did it all work out? You know, I've never done a record like this, and it I listened to it, and I can't even believe it, it you know, because it just it took that as much time as it takes you to listen to it. That's how long it took to make. I said two two part question. Could you under I mean, going in, would you think did you get a sense of um, how they might reflect on it or or use it in their lives? And secondly, with the turmoil that's going on in our world, inside and outside our homes. What value can be had in this music? I mean, you can't plan for this. This just is. This is. This is the fabric upon which it's playing. What do you think? Um, I think it's universal in that I. Uh, I was feeling a lot of the feelings that we all were feeling through the pandemic, and I was trying to channel that. But I was trying to uh, take it to a peaceful, beautiful place, and I think by design, it's it's meant to be a balm for the soul in this time that we find ourselves in.
So uh, can we move on, Kev, just for a second? Of course. Uh, your other project, the Bare Naked Ladies. Um, yes. Where are we at? What's 2022 look like for you? You know, we're just getting ready to go over to the UK for a tour that we've postponed for uh, two years in a row. Yeah. We have a show at the Royal Albert Hall nice. on yeah, January. Uh, sorry. Yeah, March 28th. So that's exciting. There's a piano at the Royal Albert, you know that. Yeah, are you suggesting I do well, some I mean, more recording? If you can get there before <laughs> sound check. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Um, and, and Talk then, about but, spirits in yeah. places, eh? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. But then the rest of the year, is it one big tour? Do you just keep going? Uh, we have a summer tour planned in the U.S. and brings us to Canada, I think. I think we're going to try to get out west for a few Canadian shows. You know, we're, we're hoping to get back to, to working and, and playing for our fans again. No kidding. Yeah, it's how, been weird that how way. How do you think the business is going to be changed by all of this? I, I hope that there is a, and I'm already feeling it at shows, there's a, a deeper appreciation for the present moment and for what, what's happening and what the, for what we're all experiencing. And I think that bodes well for uh, live music. By the way, in those three hours and those three rooms and those three pianos, did any spirits visit you? Did you feel any presence? I know you would be open to it. That's for certain. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. Uh, there were people on my mind that were with me. You know, I grew up in a church choir singing at St. Michael's Cathedral down here in Toronto. So the first location was in a cathedral. So that, that brought okay. back some memories and I channeled that. Uh, Mark was also uh, playing some delays and effects in tandem with the performances. And I was sort of bouncing off that as well. You know, sometimes a delay he would put in would sort of indicate a tempo and I would lock into that. But because we we're in a big church, you know, I could, couldn't could play a lot of dense notes. I had to just play one note, wait a little, make, leave the space. And so it's quite slow and mellow. <laughs> That's what I wanted to uh, uh, kind of leave you with. And that is that it was Miles Davis who taught me about the space between the notes. He could let a space hang for seven, eight, ten seconds and wait for the space to play itself and then jump in. Uh, you had echo going for you. So you could be playing with yourself, mm -hmm. opposite yourself, in harmony with whatever. You, you were, what was that? That... that fraction that little moment between note played note heard what was that like it was an interesting balancing act because i i had to think a little but i also was aiming not to think as much as possible and just play wow yeah do you, want to do you know you, did you, want... you ever see the documentary with ken burns about jazz yes of course and, of yeah course. there's a a great interview with Duke Ellington where the interviewer asks him, how do you write your songs? Mm -hmm. And he says, that's not writing, that's dreaming. <laughs> and he then plays this mind blowing little thing on the piano and goes, that's dreaming. And that's what I was aiming for, that kind of uh, approach. That's actually my homework book. It's, it normally would be right behind me on that uh, shelf uh -huh. there, the jazz book. And, like, I just... It went by too fast. I wanted to go by and and and, and start again and really read the stuff. And uh, I'm not. I didn't get to the Duke Ellington yet. I was still in uh, New Orleans with Bix and Louie and those those cats. That was a that was a tough town. That was a tough mm -hmm. town. And yeah. um, uh, to be a musician, uh, you were a target. So. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm getting. I, I digress from. Oh, it's okay. I love it. It's it was it's it's a fantastic read and Duke Ellington, the professor, you know, elegant man. Yeah. You can imagine. That's why I love going to cities like New Orleans and where there's that that rich musical history and you can really feel it. I tell you, there may be a second life for this music, Kevin. Somebody's currently making a film somewhere or is about to make a film somewhere, and they're going to be drawn into this music. You watch. Maybe not the whole ready. album, maybe a, a track or two. And Ghostbusters 6. <laughs> <laughs> the Marvel Universe.
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, any other projects? You know, anything we should know about? Um, you know, I'm working on a, a record of '80s covers with Hugh Marsh. That's being that's quite cool. His album? No, it's a collaboration. Okay. Yeah, but we've got members of the Sun Ra Orchestra on it, and uh, Brian Ritchie from the Violent Femmes, and Carol Pope sings a little on it. It's going to be pretty cool. Like Duran Duran, what are you two? What are you covering? You know, I wanted to do Duran Duran, the chauffeur, but Hugh said no. <laughs> so, you know, he was quite picky. We we are doing some OMD. We got some Sun Ra, some Bob Marley, some Bob Dylan. Um, Billy Idol, you know, quite a, a broad spectrum. All right. I'm, I made these notes. I want to make sure I, I answer. Oh, by the way, I, I had intended to ask you at the very top. The very first question was, are you safe? Are you well? Are you okay? Yes, I'm good. Thank you. And the two years you've been okay? Yeah, it's been challenging, just like everyone else, I'm sure, feels that way. But uh I've been lucky and I'm doing okay. All right, then. Uh, thank you for your time. You have Thank to, you. Pretty cool that we get to do uh, this. Yeah, it's, we're lucky. And I always love talking to you, Terry David, so thank you. Um, just let me know what the next project is and I'll be there. Um, and thank you for the video. It's very cool. Video, the, the visual brings all of the music to life. You should actually be thinking about a couple of more videos as well. And maybe the second single. You know, and let me know what. Let me know what you, which one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me, uh, uh, it's either rooms or among the stars. Okay. Okay. Noted. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, I'll see you down the road whenever that might be. Look forward to it. Mm.
Kevin Hearn, instrumentalist, songwriter, singer for the Bare Naked Ladies, who are heading for a two-year delayed English tour. I don't know that he's going to be playing this music anytime soon. Do enjoy this album and enjoy the video. Just for your information, the tracks we played were Among the Stars, Lonely Lately, Lou, The Garth Institute, and Reminiscence. Go find this album, Kevin Hearn, There and Then, Solo, Piano, Improvisations, the one and only Kevin Hearn, on the Mulligan Stew Podcast. Please subscribe on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And then it will come to you each and every week, just like that. Congratulations, Kevin. Way to go, ladies. Onward into 2022. And Kevin Hearn, thank you for blessing and being the first interview in the Mill Bay Studios.